I'd like to welcome those that are tuning in and those of you who are here uh, to Sunday morning at Bethel Bible Chapel. It's good to have you all with us. We are still in the book of Joshua. We come now to chapter 4 and verse 9 through 24. Our speaker this morning is Bill Kearns. Bill? Well, good morning. Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, again, we thank you for the privilege of being able to join ourselves together and know that as we do so, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is in our midst. Father, what a precious blessing to know that our Lord and Savior cares and that he's with us and in us, desires to work through us. And so, Father, as we open the pages of your book today, we would just pray that you would give us a mind which is uncluttered with the things of the world, that truly you would touch us, that we des would desire not only to learn for learning's sake, but that we might be better servants, that we might better honor and glorify the one whom we love, the one who loved us. And so, Father, again, we would pray for your help, your direction, and your guidance, understanding, and wisdom, and we'd ask it all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Joshua chapter 4. This morning, with apologies to Thomas, <coughs> Brother Thomas, we're going to back up and look a little bit at the beginning of chapter 4, and then we'll move forward through chapter 4 and on to uh, chapter 5. So Thomas kind of borrowed my stuff last week, and so I'm going to borrow a little of his stuff this week. But the reason that we need to do that is that this particular portion of Scripture, you really need to see the whole of it together in order to really get what the Lord is teaching, I think. And so it's hard to break it up and just take little pieces of it. You really need to look at it as a whole. We do break it up because we like to break it into sections that you know, fit in the time slot, but, but really this particular portion of Scripture needs to be seen as a whole. So, like I said, we'll borrow a little bit from Thomas's section and then we'll move on through the chapter and to chapter 5. And I would tell you up front that this message is a two-part message. So we will not complete it today. Lord willing, we will finish that on March the 18th. So a two-part lesson this morning. Well, in chapter 4, we find the people of Israel following the instructions of the Lord and Joshua in crossing over the Jordan as a first step in preparation to conquer and possess the inheritance. So that's where we are. But before we get into this study this morning, I would like to speak to you from the heart. From the heart. And I think this passage so eloquently speaks to a problem that is facing really all of Christendom today. And that's the fact that there is a lessening degree of urgency in the heart of the saints. There is a, an attitude in our society in this country as a whole where they are more interested in entertainment and in the things that involve their lives, their, the sports, the children's activities and all the rest. And the outside world is hard to reach. Now, that's not an excuse. The world's always been hard to reach. But I believe there's always people who are hungering and thirsting if we as believers will do what we need to do to reach out and show them the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in our own lives. If we will be dedicated and consecrated. We had a conversation, Beverly and I did, with our daughter uh, last night. And she attends a local church down in Oakton, Virginia. It's a beautiful facility. They've got it all. They've got a, a very nice auditorium. They've got a basketball court. A, they've got kitchens and a, and a school. It's a beautiful facility. They are finding, they are struggling, finding it difficult to pay the bills because there has been a, a, a smaller and smaller 
um, congregation as time has gone on. We see it in our own little gathering. You know, we've had a number of families move away, no longer with us. We've had a, a number of pass away to go on to be with the Lord. And our group is, is becoming smaller and smaller, and it's concerning to me, and it's concerning to the elders, because we're wondering what will happen. And we're asking ourselves, what would the Lord have us to do? And so as we go into this, this message this morning, I believe the Lord gave it to us at this time for a reason. As a matter of fact, questioning that in my mind for a couple of weeks, especially with what's going on in, in where my daughter attends a local church, thinking, what needs to be done? What, O oh Lord, is missing? And this morning, as I was reviewing my notes, it dawned on me. This is the answer. This is the answer. I believe that what the church needs is consecration. Consecration. Our lesson this morning teaches us that consecration must come before conquest. The children of Israel were getting ready to go through and conquer the land and possess the inheritance. But before they did, they needed consecration. It's our desire to go forth, even in this time when the world seems so far from God and without desire. They're ripe for conquest. But we will not be able to succeed if we first do not consecrate ourselves to the task. And so this morning, we are going to look at the seven R's of Gilgal, or Gilgal, Consecration Before Conquest. Let me repeat the title of the lesson. The seven R's of Gilgal, Consecration Before Conquest. So we might ask ourselves, well, what is consecration? The scripture has at least six different words that it uses to describe consecration or that might be interpreted into the English as consecration in one of its forms or another. And in essence, here's what those words mean. First, to be separate. And it's talking about being separate from the earthly day-to-day -day things. Understanding that we have a spiritual need. And that that must be first. And that we're set apart to that. To be separate from the earthly day to day. And to be set aside to the spiritual things. Secondly, it means to be fulfilled to the full. I'm sorry, it means to be filled, not fulfilled. It means to be filled to the full. It means to be so focused that nothing else takes priority because there is not room for worldly things, filled to the full. It means to be clean, to be clean from the dust, the dirt, and frankly, from the moral filth of the world, to be clean. It means to devote, to give the things of the Lord's first place in our hearts, that is, to love him first, and best, to love him first and best, to devote. <clears throat> Excuse me, it means to dedicate, to with forethought and purpose make all the provisions necessary to serve. Let me repeat that. It means to dedicate, to with forethought and purpose make all the provisions necessary to serve. And sixthly, it means to set, S-E-T. We West Virginians probably don't speak <laughs> plainly enough for you to understand what I meant. S-E-T, to set. It means to, uh, to set a gem in a setting, if you will. The putting into place as a final step all the things necessary to please him that we might be a gemstone of great beauty reflecting his light in a dazzling array to set. 
So with all that said, let's go back to our scripture now and read Joshua chapter 4. I'm going to begin at verse 1, sorry Thomas, and I'm going to read through verse 12 of chapter 5. It's a lot of scripture. Scripture is worth reading. It's worth reading over and over. So bear with me and be blessed. And it came to pass when all the people were completely passed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, saying, Take ye twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take here out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. Let me stop there just a minute. I'm going to challenge you with something. Who had bore the ark? What does it say about who bore the ark in this case? The priest. The priest bore the ark. But whose duty was it to bear the ark normally? And Ed? Yes. So here's my challenge to you. Why? Why in this instance was it the priest who were charged with carrying the ark? Think about it. We'll talk about it next time. Where was I? Okay. Verse 3. And command ye them, saying, Take here out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, as Thomas shared with us last time, these weren't small rocks. These were stones. They were big, big enough that you needed to carry them on your shoulder. So they weren't big boulders that were so heavy that a man couldn't bear them. But nevertheless, they were not little small stones. They were, they were rocks that were big enough that they needed to be carried upon the shoulder. So you can in your own mind imagine about what size they would be. Verse 6, that this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that before the that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan, and the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so, as Joshua commanded, and took up the twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord spoke unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them into the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priest who bore the ark stood, and they are there unto this day. For the priest who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything that was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hastened and passed over. And it came to pass, when all the people were completely passed over, that the ark of the Lord passed over, and the priest in the presence of the people, and the children of Reuben, and the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, passed over armed before the children of Israel, as Moses spoke unto them. About 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord into the, unto battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord magnified Joshua in, all, in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord spoke unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests who bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of the Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come ye up out of the Jordan. And it came to pass that the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of the Jordan, and the souls of the priests were lifted up unto the dry land, that the waters of the Jordan returned into their place and flowed over all its banks as they did before. 
So you have to remember the Jordan was in the time of flood stage when they were passing over. And so that was all rolled up. And then as they passed over, those waters returned and they went to those same high levels which they were before the children of Israel had passed over the Jordan River. Verse 10. And the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan did Joshua set up in Gilgal. And he spoke unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean the, these stones? Then ye shall s- let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the side of the Jordan westward and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart melted. Neither was there any spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua did circumcise all the people who came out of Egypt, who were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people who came out were circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war who had come out of Egypt were consumed because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord and to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers that he would give us a land that floweth with milk and honey. And their children, when he raised up their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach from Egypt off of you. Wherefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal unto this day. Let me repeat that verse. It's key. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Gilgal literally means the rolling or the rolling away. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the passage and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. Just a coincidence, they happened to cross over the Jordan and be right in the land at the prescribed time for the keeping of the Passover. Of course, I say that facetiously. There are no accidents in the Lord's timing, but isn't it, isn't it, just amazing and lovely the way that the Lord arranges our lives because he does the same thing for us. Verse 10, again, and the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho and they did eat of the old grain of the land on the next day after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched grain in the very same day. And the manna ceased on the next day after they had eaten of the old grain of the land. Neither had the children Israel, children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now we're going to stop there. So again, what is the theme of our lesson? 
It's the seven R's of Gilgal, consecration before, consecra uh, before conquest. Consecration before conquest. So what are the, character, the characteristics of consecration? We saw what the definition was, but what are the characteristics of conse consecration? Well, you noticed in chapter 4 that the Lord had the children of Israel to set up how many monuments of stone? Well, I'm getting all kinds of different answers. Two. He had them to set up two. He took 12 stones from where the priest's feet stood in the Jordan, and those stones he took over and set them up in Gilgal. And then he took 12 stones from Gilgal, and he took them back to the river and had them set them at the priest's feet. At the priest's feet. So there were two. There were two stones. Our brother Thomas mentioned in his message last week that the point of these memorials were for a what? Remembrance. That's what memorials are for. When we put a memorial over our loved ones in a cemetery, why do we do that? Just because it's tradition? No. We are memorializing that person, and they're often inscribed with the dates of their birth and the dates of their death, and sometimes, uh, you know, they've got a little verse on them or whatever desired to be imprinted, and it's done for a memorial so that the family can go back and remember, so that the children and the grandchildren can go back and remember. And people, generations later, can go and know about that particular individual, who they were married to. A lot of times, how many children they have will even be engraved, and so on. It's for a memorial. And that's why the Lord had them set up these stones. They were set up as a memorial for remembrance. And we're going to see that the scripture, the first star of consecration, is remembrance, but not remembrance alone. It's remembrance and recitation. Remembrance and recitation. I didn't want to come out right the second time. But here it is. Let's look at verse 6. That this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in times to come, saying, what mean you by these stones? So here's the children. They're asking... Why was this done? Why are these stones here? Why are they set up the way that they are? Then you shall answer them. Notice answer. Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off and all these stones shall be for a next word. Memorial unto the children of Israel. Look over at verse 22. Then, and again, when your children in 21, when your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, there's the recitation, the recitation, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land, and the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea when he dried up them from before us until we were gone over okay so it's, it's it is a remembrance and a recitation of what that memorial means that is necessary for consecration it's necessary for consecration why because the people need to know the children need to know and who all needs to know number one who did we say the children. Verse 24, who else? That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. So first, it's the children. And then it's all the people of the earth. And then it's who else? 
you. We should say us. It's us. Look at the last part of verse 24. That ye might fear the Lord your God until you don't come back. Is that what it says? Forever. Forever there's a person and a reason. The children, all the earth, and our very selves. Who was the second set of stones for? What happened, what happened after the priest's feet hit dry land? Whew. There comes the water that had been cut off. What did it do? It covered the stones. Who could see the stones? The Lord God of heaven was the one who could see the stones. That's who. The Lord God of heaven. You know what? It's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture. What the children of Israel were saying is they took those stones from Gilgal, where they were beginning a new life. There would be times when they would have the burden of sin upon them. And what would they need to do with that sin? They would need to take it and put it under the blood. In their time frame, under the blood of the sacrifice. In our time frame, under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the fulfillment of those offerings and sacrifices. And that's how God saw it. They put it to death. They put their sin to death. That's what we do, by the way. We who were dead in trespasses and sin are made alive in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do that, and when we do that, our sin is what? It's taken away from us. Who bore that sin? It didn't just disappear. By the way, get out of that out of your mind. If that's your thinking that when you were saved, your sin just disappeared, it didn't disappear. Because it had been placed on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God judged his son there for us. He bore our sin. Your sin just didn't disappear. It was judged and done on the cross of Calvary. What a marvelous truth and a marvelous pi picture. That sin, in other words, died. And that's what's pictured here. That water comes back over and those stones are in the picture of death, the Jordan, and they're covered forever. And they're just as, as our sins are covered forever, they're, they've been taken care of, dealt with, buried in the deepest sea, the scripture says, as far as the east is from the west, gone from us. The children of Israel would never see those stones again. Oh, beloved, you'll never see your sin again either. What a wonderful truth is pictured. What about the, the stones that were taken out of the Jordan and set up on the other side? That's the children of Israel who were dead in trespasses and sin, and now they've been born up and set in the promised land. Who did it? The Lord God of heaven did it. How did he do it? He did it by stopping something. What does he stop in the life of a Christian? He stops eternal death, doesn't he? Amen? When I pass from this earth, if I happen to do so before the Lord comes home or comes back to rapture his church, if I take that path to the presence of the Lord, I will never die regardless of what people might say about me. I will be more alive at that time than I ever was while I was here on earth. That's what was being memorialized by those stones which were set up. It's a new beginning. And what you're going to find, and maybe if we have time, we'll look at that next time. You're going to find that as the children of Israel went from conquest to conquest to conquest, what did they do? Where did they return? They would return back to Gilgal. Time after time after time, they would return back to Gilgal, the place of the rolling away and the place of the stones. 
What a beautiful truth. The first R, remembrance and recitation. So let me ask you a question. How many ordinances are there for the church? Two. Coincidence? I don't think so. There are two ordinances of the church. What are they? Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. What is it that baptism portrays? It portrays that here we are and we, what? Die. We die. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but we literally die with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what? We are raised to newness of life. That's what's pictured by the water. That's, that's death. But we are raised from death. And we are raised to a newness of life. It's the same picture. It's the same message. What about the Lord's Supper? Well, let's just take the time. I'm going to take the time because we'll have time next week. So... <laughs> Let's go, to, let's go to Matthew's Gospel first, chapter 6. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 26. When you turn there and it's not what you're expecting, you have to stop and say, okay, what did I really mean? Matthew chapter 26. 26 to 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the, redem for the remission of sins. And by the way, when he says, Drink ye all of it, the better translation would be, All of you drink it. Okay? You say, Why do you say that? Because I once attended a Lutheran service where, was it Lutheran? I believe it was Lutheran. Lutheran service where, the minister had the cup and when the communion service was over there was still stuff left and, and it was a big cup and he took that cup and he drained it all and then he took the napkin and he wiped it out when it was done I felt sorry for that poor fellow I, I know I could never have done that but where do they get that? Because they're taking the scripture here literally as it is translated here, and it's drinky all of it. But what the better translation is, all of you drink of it, is the thought. For this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. Now let's go to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. By the way, where I'm from, I'm from the mountains, and you know, I know you all make fun of my twang sometimes. <laughs> but there's a little village outside of the town where Beverly and I used to live, and it isn't Corinth. It's Corinth. If you ask somebody where Corinth is in that place, they laugh at you. And they call it Corinth. So... Sometimes I may pronounce things a little differently from you. It's my background. I can't help it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's begin reading. Let's just begin reading at verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you do show forth the Lord's death till he come again. Now we're going to get into detail in this next week. But the one thing that I wanted you to pick up here as Paul explains the Lord's Supper and what had been revealed to him by the person of the Lord Jesus is found in verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do what? You do show forth. The word there literally is proclaim and can even be translated as recite and also as preach. You're preaching it. You're re proclaiming it. You're reciting it. And so what was it that we said? Remembrance and recitation. Remembrance and recitation. These are the memorials that are given to the church and they're given for a reason. You know why we celebrate the Lord's Supper? First of all, just like those stones which were buried in the water, the Lord's Supper speaks to what? The Lord God of heaven. It's where he receives praise and worship and honor and glory from the church. That's its purpose. What a wonderful, wonderful memorial. And it's first of all to the Lord. But just like that, those other, that other memorial which was set up in Gilgal, it's also for our children. For our children. What a shame that there are some children who never learn or understand that memorial because their parents don't come or don't take them. What a, what a crime. I truly believe that you can't be consecrated to the Lord's work fully and as you ought if you aren't doing that. Now, I know some would disagree, but I think it's what the Scripture says. It's so important and so important for our children. Who else does it testify to? God in heaven, the Lord of glory, our children, who else? To ourselves, it certainly does. Doesn't it just reinforce, you all know who are regular attenders of the Lord's Supper, how you are just so blessed after having spent time in the presence of the Lord where his saints are proclaiming his glory and his value and, and praise goes forth for what God has done for us in the giving of his own son and that's what's presented in the, in the bread. It is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ pictured as being broken. Now it's not his literal body but it's pictured that we might remember. We need to remember. That we might remember. And then the cup speaks of the blood which was poured out for us. And my friends, I know there are some people who says, oh, you know, you all do that every week and that just gets so old. Not if you're the right frame and in the right mind, it doesn't. It becomes more precious each and every time we break bread together because it's all about him. It's not about us. It's all about him. How can you ever get tired? To say that you get tired of that is to say you get tired of the Lord God of heaven. God's infinite. We could never, ever fully proclaim all that should be said about the Lord Jesus Christ. We could never do that. What a blessing it is. So it's for the Lord. It's for our children. It's for ourselves. Who else does it speak to? The world. It speaks to the world. You know, I think maybe I've told you all before, but we used to have a neighbor who lived across the street from us. And there was one Sunday when our car was, and I don't remember now why, but our car was still in the driveway. Well, they called and had left a message on the phone when we got home and said, we saw your car and we knew that at 9 o'clock that car was never there and we thought maybe something was wrong. They knew where we were. They knew we were at the chapel. And in years later, that neighbor, the husband, actually came in and joined us. Now, 
Uh, his wife never did, and they're now living in New York, and I'm not, I've lost track of them. But it just shows you that you are proclaiming, even to the world, to those who are on the outside. They're watching, and you're preaching, and you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. So there we have it. One more thing. What else did they do, which was an outward visible sign in this case? Verse 2 of chapter 5. And at that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the reason why Joshua did circumcise all the people who came out of Egypt, who were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. So all those who had been circumcised because they were in the wilderness for 40 years and at that time they did not practice circumcision, none of the youngsters who were young at that time who now were adults and who were crossing or getting ready to cross over, I'm sorry, had crossed over, had been what? Circumcised. They hadn't been. Could they partake of the Passover if they weren't circumcised? No. It was not allowed. So they had to be circumcised. Circumcised who was, was required actually of all who would be a part of the Abrahamic covenant and you know what that was right that was where the Lord God of heaven well let's just go there it only take a few minutes <laughs> Genesis chapter 17 I hesitate to just tell stories about things because inevitably I get something wrong but if I read it from the scripture it's not going to be wrong chapter 17 and verse let's begin at verse 6 the account actually begins at verse 1 but verse 6, the Lord God saying, I will make thee an exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a sojourner, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep. Part of this was God's covenant, right? He was going to take care of this. But part of it, there was something that they had to do. What was that? This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you every male child in your generations he that is born in the house or bought with money of any foreigner who is not of thy seed he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant and the uncircumcised male child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Pretty serious. But if they wanted to possess the land, God says, guess what? You're going to have to be what? Circumcised. Circumcised. So circumcision here was a necessary thing to be done. But what's that got to do with dedication? What has that got to do with consecration? What is the second R of our study? Notice what it says back in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 2. At the end of that, he says that they would need to be circumcised. What? The, the children of Israel, the second time the second time the children of Israel had been circumcised 
Then there was a 40-year period because they had disobeyed the Lord God of heaven. They had refused to enter the promised land. So he says, okay, none of you will ever see the land of promise who are above 20 years old. And so they go out, and for 40 years they wander in the wilderness while one by one. Those, children, those people, the children of Israel, who were 20 years old and above died with the exception of Caleb and Joshua. All the rest of them passed. You know, that wilderness was nothing but one very large graveyard. But now here these were, and they needed to be circumcised. It was a sign of their repentance. That's the second R. First, remembrance and recitation. Then the second R is repentance. They showed that they had changed their minds. They had changed their way. They were ready to go in and possess the land. Repentance. As we start to apply these things to the very problems that we were discussing in our introduction, I'm wondering, I wonder what the Lord God of heaven could do with his church through his church if they would but remember and recite and repent. Repent. Beloved, I hope that you'll consider these things that we've talked about this morning and come back on the 18th because even more important, if there could be any more important, maybe I shouldn't try to classify them, but some very important characteristics of consecration will be shown in the scripture. And I think we really need it. I think we, as Bethel Bible Chapel, McMurray, Pennsylvania, really need these characteristics if we want to grow if we want to honor him, if we want to glorify him, if we want to hear those words when we stand before the Bema, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Brother Jerry, would you lead us in a hymn and close us in prayer, please?